doing well. This is a bit weird. I don't think I've felt this far out of my comfort zone since I was in a statistical thermodynamics tutorial back in about 1994. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a nice little chemistry and you'll get everyone on site. So what I have to do tonight is approach this whole thing a bit like an experiment. So anyone who's actually done an experiment will know that when you do an experiment, you've got to control it carefully. So what that means is you need to measure your response. So you guys are my sample, and I need to measure your response. So I need to have some sort of idea of what the maximal response is. So that's my positive control group. What that means is there has to be a subsection of my sample that are guaranteed to exhibit the maximal response. So what that means in this context is you have to laugh at every single thing I say. <laughs> so I was thinking that we would actually set this out right now. So I think what we'll do is we'll start with this positive control group and we'll start it here. And I'm thinking we should probably go right the way to about here. <laughs> so what I would like all of you guys that have just pointed out, I want you to laugh at every single thing I say. You shouldn't find it too difficult, but you know, maybe just... But, you know, we've got to be proper about this. And what I also need is a negative control group. So clearly the negative control group is someone or some group of people who don't laugh at anything. So I think what we'll do is we will make that you. <laughs> so, Lindsay, could you please just not laugh at anything? She's thinking that's not going to be that difficult. <laughs> Okay, well actually, you've not got me on the best day. I've been a bit down for the last couple of days, and the reason for that is because I, well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's because I'm a Hibs fan. Sounds right. It's always fun. The reason for that, for those of you who don't follow Scottish football, an accusation which is often levelled at us Hibs fans, actually, <laughs> is that on Sunday we lost the Scottish Cup final to Celtic. Yet again. Yeah. It's not funny. <laughs> Do you know that it's actually been 111 years since we won that goddamn oh. Think about all the things that have happened in science since 1902, because that's when it happened. It was 15 years before Einstein came up with this theory of relativity. It was about 50 years before Watson and Crick solved the structure of the DNA double helix. It was even a year before the Wright brothers managed a powered flight. <laughs> if you think about it, from a scientific point of view, if you consider each of these consecutive seasons in which they failed to win the cup as an experiment, it shows a really impressive reproducibility. <laughs> I'm actually beginning to think that if they do win that cup at some point, there's going to be some rupture in the space-time continuum. We're going to end up in some alternative universe where they actually need a trophy cabinet down at Easter Road. <laughs> anyway, I'm not here to talk about football. I am a protein crystallographer, something which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, right? So maybe I should explain what that means. So what I do is I take a protein sample and I grow crystals of it. Now these crystals are beautiful, they're tiny little gems. You all know what crystals look like, diamonds are crystals, emeralds are crystals, but these things are absolutely tiny, they're literally microscopic. The sort of thing that if you had it mounted in a ring and gave it to your missus, she's not going to be very happy. <laughs> these are anti-bling. <laughs> So to get a hold of these crystals, you actually have to spend an awful lot of time and an awful lot of effort and go through a whole load of different experiments trying to find the right conditions for these things to grow. It's not easy. Once you've got them, what you have is this little beautiful gem that contains all the wonders of nature at atomic detail. It's a really special thing to get. Once you've got them, you then have to very carefully and very precisely manipulate them. You have to take them, you have to dip them in some antifreeze solution, then you have to flash cool them in liquid nitrogen, all so that we can look after them properly. <clears throat> so that we can then transport them to where we might want to do our experiment or store them. Then, and only then, can we put them in an x-ray beam and fry the living fuck out of them. <laughs> 
So these x-rays that we use, we can make them in the lab. We've got an x-ray diffractometer up at King's Buildings, but what we often do is we take the crystals to a synchrotron source. Synchrotron, sounds cool, doesn't it? <laughs> if you like warehouses and industrial estates on the edge of European cities, then yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know what a synchrotron is, it is basically a circular warehouse with high energy electrons and really, really powerful magnets. If you've never seen one, they're actually a little bit like the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Everyone knows what that is, right? The thing is CERN in Switzerland. So this is the machine that the particle physicists have been using to try and get the Higgs boson, try and find it. The thing that that floppy-haired twat Brian Cox goes on about in the telly. <laughs> I don't understand this. How come particle physics is somehow trendy? It's particle physics, for God's sake. You're having a laugh. You should be having a laugh, all of you, apart from you. Anyway, these guys, your Brian Coxes and your Jim Alkalilis, they end up talking, they're greedy bastards, they end up talking about not just their subject, their particle physics, but you see them on the TV talking about chemistry and even biology. But I mean, you'd like to think that there were chemists and biologists who were perfectly capable of going on telly and carrying out these sorts of programs. These particle physicists coming over here, taking our jobs. <laughs> I just don't trust them. I mean, the things that they come up with, they just sound like they're made up. <laughs> but I reckon they just got together in a big room somewhere and they decided to come up with names for different things that they could try and discover so that they could get grant income. <laughs> One of them's an anagram of hard on for God's sake. They really are telling me this. <coughs> yeah, no, mean physics don't really get on very well. <laughs> Ever since school, I've never really been any good at it. Even today, I can't get a Van de Graaff generator to make my hair stand on end. <laughs> So this Large Hadron Collider, the one that we were talking about, let's get back to the idea of X-rays and synchrotrons. The one, the LHC has a circumference of its ring of 27 kilometers, coincidentally just big enough to get Brian Cox's massive ego inside. <laughs> but the ones that we use aren't quite as big as that. The one that I used to normally go to was, it had a circumference of round about a mile. Now that's quite big. If you're carrying out your experiment on one side of the ring and the coffee room's on the other side of the ring, it's a long way to walk. But you didn't have to walk. What they do, very helpfully, is they put bikes around the ring. So you can just pick up a bike, cycle to where your experiment is, drop the bike off, get on with it, pick up another one, go wherever you need to do. The interesting thing about that was, is that everyone else has got the same idea. So what you find yourself doing is cycling around trying to avoid these pale people with bad complexions on bikes. It's like some sort of post-apocalyptic post zombie Amsterdam. <laughs> I don't get to go to these things anymore, which is a real shame. <laughs> on the upside, I no longer have to spend 48 hours straight staring at a screen, but, but on the downside, I have to pay for my own holidays. No more free ski trips for me. I used to be able to get about a week out of a 48 hour synchrotron trip. Okay, I'm going to finish with the joke for a change. You can all laugh, you all should laugh apart from you again. Keep it quiet. Now this is a joke that if you have ever sat in one of my first year quantum chemistry lectures, you will have heard before, but you didn't laugh at. But now you're older, you have a much more sophisticated sense of humour. You will get this joke and you will laugh at it. So, Werner Heisenberg is driving down the Autobahn. <laughs> He's listening to Kraftwerk or whatever the hell he would be listening to. And he gets pulled over by the police. And the police say to him, do you know how fast you were going? And he says, no, no but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> Thank you very much, you've been great.